and a year later, on July 4th, 2005, his parents, his three sisters, and his widow and his son all get together for his memorial. And they go to the family's country house where they've been for every summer and every uh, winter vacation for the last 40 years. And so I was interested in what it's like to sort of make everyone who's an adult come back to this confined space where there's a lot of familiarity and see what it does to the family. It's Notebook on Cities and Culture. I'm Colin Marshall, coming to you from West Hollywood, sitting down with a guest. You've maybe heard, if you've been a very long-time listener to my shows, you've uh, heard him oh, four and a half years ago on the show's predecessor, The Marketplace of Ideas. It's Joshua Hankin, author of previously Matrimony, now The World Without You. He's also the director of the MFA fiction writing program at Brooklyn College, and his book tour for this new book has brought him here to Los Angeles more than once. And... The idea of having these fam- this family converge, I mean, I want to know how, when you're writing, when you're writing novels, how much, how much do you think of moving them to a place of convergence deliberately as an author, and how much do you think of it as sort of letting them converge? Does that make any sense as a question? Yeah, it makes a lot of sense, and I think it's a, an important question. Um, there's always a tension for a writer between knowing too much and knowing too little. And I always tell my graduate students that it's fine if you think you know where your novel or where your story is going. But if you prove to be right, then you're in trouble. You better be wrong. Um, and I think, you know, if you know too much, if you're too sure what's going to happen to the book, then you don't allow your characters to breathe. And you get what a friend of mine calls Lipton Cup of Story. You're basically <laughs> injecting your characters into a preordained plot. On the other hand, if you have no sense at all of what's going to happen, you can end up writing a lot of pretty sentences about mountains and sunsets that don't add up to anything. So um, I often think of the Passover Seder, which I don't know, How many of your listeners have been to a Passover Seder? But the question at the Passover Seder is, why is this night different from all other nights? And that, to me, is the fiction question, too, is that you can be writing about any number of weeks or months or days. Why today? What's important? And in the case of this book, it's pretty clear what's important, namely that there is a son who died a year ago, a journalist killed tragically in Iraq. Now the parents are splitting up as a result of the grief. So the occasion for the telling is obvious. You know, Alice McDermott has a novel called Weddings and Wakes, and I think that that actually is instructive for fiction writers in general. I try to set my stories, my novels, in situations where people can come into contact, where there's potential conflict, where there's high stakes. You know, weddings, wakes, funerals, bar mitzvahs, graduations, Thanksgiving meals. So I think what I do is I intentionally create a situation where something can happen, but I don't know what's going to happen in advance, and then I let the characters take me where they take me. We talked last time about this phrase, I believe you say it to students, where you have a character riding a bus and you need to have somebody put their hand on that character's thigh, if I've recalled correctly. And the story comes when the character reacts to that. They have a choice of what to do. Is that an applicable uh, metaphor for any of the writing in the world without you? Absolutely. I mean, I think that... Uh, you have very good memory, Colin. I think that... Um, and I, t- I talk about this with my students a lot. They often write about characters who are very passive and who are just watching. And I think that's in part because writers are watchers, and so they tend to distance themselves from what's going on around them. But I think that for fiction, you know, you can't avoid conflict. A lot of us are conflict avoidant in real life, but in fiction you have to have conflict. And so what I say is that imagine you're sitting on the bus and sitting alone thinking your thoughts, and a stranger sits down and puts his or her hand on your thigh. You have to do something. You can shout, you can get up, I suppose you can put your hand back on the, on the stranger's thigh. I mean, I suppose you could do nothing, but in that case, doing nothing is doing something. So I think either literally or more often figuratively, in fiction, characters have to be putting their hands on each other's thighs. And I think that's certainly the case in the world without you, in the sense that there are big events happening. I think the, the biggest act of putting hands on thighs is that Marilyn and David, at the beginning of the book, the parents, announce that they're separating, and that sort of changes everything for these adult sisters um, and for Leo's widow. Uh, what they had assumed was true is no longer true, and so that is the big hand-on-thigh gesture, and then everything comes as a result of that. A listener who hasn't read about this book yet or hasn't read the book itself, they'll think, geez, there's a lot of family drama going on here, and then he, did he say the Iraq War? There's a journalist killed in the Iraq War that's, that's a, a son of this family? I mean, it's, there's at least true, uh, at least two very very, very strong, I don't know if devices is the word, but there's, there's two very strong elements working here. How many, how, many is, how many is too many? Can you go many past two? Yeah, you know, it, it's funny. I, I think about this a lot, and again, with my graduate students, you know, sometimes we'll see a story up in workshop, 
where there are four characters and it just feels way too many and it feels really diffuse. And then we'll see a story that has 20 characters that doesn't feel diffuse. And I, the analogy I, I, I make is I think about a spine. Like if you have a solid spine for your story and it's really well-formed and sturdy, then you can really afford to have a lot of neurons, a lot of nerves jutting out of the, coming out of the spine. Uh, if, on the other hand, you don't have a solid spine, then you just have a lot of nerves floating around out there aimlessly. And I think that because the book really does have a solid spine in the sense that it takes place in very confined space and time, and because there are two central big events, first one being Leo's death a year ago, second one being Marilyn and David's separation now, I think that gives the book a kind of focus that allows me to explore much more than I would be able to do otherwise. So it's very hard to say that there's an exact number. I think that I'm able to do more because of that spine in this case. You've mentioned in other interviews, and there have been many about this book, that I believe Matrimony had you throwing out 2,000 pages to get this reasonably sized book left uh-huh. over. The World Without You, I think even more pages, maybe 3,000 pages thrown away. Uh, and not, not really thrown away, not literally thrown away. Well, physically thrown away, right. but not actually thrown away. How, how much do you throw away before that spine becomes clear to you? Yeah, I mean, I throw away as much as I need to. And people always ask me, you know, throwing out thousands of pages, I mean, is that hard? And I find it to be incredibly easy. I mean, I wouldn't want to know that I was throwing out the stuff before I threw it out. But once, it's, the, it's what economists call sunk cost. And I think you have to write a certain number of bad pages in order to get to the good pages. And there's no mathematical formula. But what was interesting with both Matrimony and The World Without You is that Matrimony took me 10 years to write. This took me five years to write. Um, but in both cases, I would say that the vast majority of the book that got published got written toward the end, like in the last year of matrimony, in the last six months with the world without you. And it wasn't like I was sitting around eating bonbons all that time, and then I said, okay, time to kick in. I think it's much more that you you spend a lot of time making mistakes until finally something clicks. And then, in the last few months, the book sort of miraculously kind of starts to write itself. So I very much feel that it's not throwing away stuff. It's more about investing all those days and figuring out who those characters are. You read about many good novels being the tip of an iceberg, but it sounds like you have to write the whole iceberg and leave the tip. You don't just write the tip. You, you left the tip, and you wrote the iceberg. Yeah, I think, I think that's important. You know, I talk about this with my students some. You know, sometimes I'll say to them, you know, I don't feel like you know your characters well enough, and I'll ask them a series of questions about their characters, and they may say to me, well, I don't see why that has to be in the story, and I'll say it doesn't have to be in the story, but you need to know it. And then if you know it, that will sort of and that will sort of filter up toward what's actually in the book. And so the tip of the iceberg implies the whole iceberg. But I think one way you get to know the character is by actually writing that iceberg. And then, then you erase it. And I think by erasing it, what you're doing is just simply putting it beneath the surface so that it can shine some kind of light on what actually does uh, become part of the book. Now, we've told the listeners that the characters in the world without you are family members to various degrees of extension. They all come together and, and for this memorial a year after the sun. The, the journalist in Iraq is killed. Tell me how much you believe, or in writing this book, believe the, the uh, I don't even know what the origin is, but the phrase, character is plot. Does that resonate with you, or did it while you were writing this book? It does. I think character is plot, and I think that, you know, um, Michael Cunningham, you know, who wrote The Hours and was the director of Brooklyn uh, Fiction MFA program before me, recently came in to give a craft class to the students, and he talked about the ways in which If you ask enough questions about your character, you will eventually come up with a narrative. I mean, think of of a banal detail, like does a character sleep on her side, her back, or her stomach? It doesn't seem that important, but what if she sleeps on her side because she hears better out of one ear, and she sleeps on her good ear so she doesn't hear her infant cry? There's a story growing right out of that. And I think that, you know, the way that I come up with a story is through character, since for me, character is most centrally what fiction is about. So, for instance, in Matrimony, the characters, uh, Julian and Mia, who are at the center of the book and who eventually marry, they meet freshman year in the uh, college laundry room. But Julian discovers Mia in the freshman Facebook when he and his friend Carter see her there, and they dub her Mia from Montreal. This is a literal Facebook, by the way, not the Facebook. Sorry, it's a literal Facebook, (laughs) um, not the the online Facebook. And um, they dub her Mia from Montreal, and that's the phrase that came to me. And I think it probably came to me because my freshman girlfriend at college was named Laura, and my roommate dubbed her Laura from Larchmont. 
So I think I had the alliteration on my mind. But until I actually wrote that, I didn't know that she came from Montreal. I could have had her be Mia from Madagascar or Mia from Maryland. And if I had her be Mia from Maryland, there could have been a long section in the book about the Maryland crabbing industry off the Maryland coast. Um, but it turned out it was Mia from Montreal. So that was a detail that just came to me. And then I had to ask myself, well, how did her family get to Montreal? Because here she was going to college in Massachusetts. So it's possible I could have created her as f- coming from a family of long-standing Quebecois secessionists, or I could have created her as I did, as being from parents who met in graduate school when they were at Harvard. The father studied physics, the mother started, studied art history, the father got a job at McGill, and the mother gave up her career for the father, and Mia never forgave her parents for that arrangement. And so she was intent on coming back to college in Massachusetts to both retrace and refashion her mother's steps. Now, all that grew out of Mia from Montreal. I didn't know that. But I think what you do is sort of like a game of associative telephone. You can do anything for your first word, and then the first word of the book requires a second word to own up to it, and then the third word has to own up to the first two. So I think the way that you come up with with narrative is to think of who your characters are. You say Mia from Montreal, and then you say, how did she get to Montreal? And then you get a story. And the same thing happens... Uh, with the world without you with anything that I write is that I start to plumb character as deeply as I can and the more I plumb it the closer I get to having a story come out of it it seems like something readers often don't understand if they don't write is how exactly an author uses their pieces of their lives in a book because I mean that whole Laura from Larchmont thing they, I don't think any reader would guess that's how you would use a piece of your life you know just make the alliteration different and then you have a whole fiction coming from that what kind of what what were some of the Laura from Larchmonts you were able to pull out of your life and completely repurpose for the world without you? Because you've said in other interviews, not autobiographical at all. So was were you able to, to use much in a way that you can even identify now? Sure. I mean, you know, there are a lot of small details like Laura from Larchmont that, you know, throughout the book I'm trying to come up with some. Um, I mean, there's a reference to the fact that um, Leo, the journalist who was killed, that he had an old girlfriend from high school whom the mother was very partial to and that she had an extra toe. She had six toes. And and uh, Thisbe, Leo's widow, calls her uh, the girl with the extra toe. I knew someone when I was growing up who had an extra toe. Uh, Clarissa's wearing a T-shirt toward the beginning of the book that says, what if the hokey pokey is, really is what it's all about? I saw that bumper sticker the same day I read that page, uh-huh. so I was freaked out. Yes, I mean, I, I, I keep a notebook with me. I see bumper stickers. I mean, I saw a bumper sticker that said, um, Jesus loves you, but I'm his favorite. And that made it into the book. So there are a lot of little details that get completely refashioned. I would say in a deeper way, though, that, that good fiction really has to be emotionally autobiographical, which doesn't mean that the characters have to be based on real people or the situation has to be real. But on some level, I think the book has to be close enough to the author that he or she feels a kind of risk or danger. And, you know, the inspiration for the book was I had a cousin who died of Hodgkin's disease when he was in his late 20s. And I was a toddler at the time, so I didn't really know him. But his death hung over the extended family for years. Um, And every year, my father's side of the family has a family reunion. We see each other only once a year, most of us. So we catch each other up on what we've been up to. And one year, when I was in my early 30s, my aunt, my cousin's mother, got up and said, I have two sons. And we were all quite startled because she'd once had two sons, but her older son had died of Hodgkin's disease nearly 30 years earlier. And she wasn't crazy. I mean, she knew her son was dead, but this is her way of saying that that was the singular event in her life and nothing would be the same forevermore. And meanwhile, uh, my cousin's wife, she eventually moved on. She got remarried. She had a family. And it got me thinking about the differences between losing a spouse, losing a partner, and losing a child. I might have been very fortunate to have neither of those things happen to me. But I imagine that as hard as it is to lose a spouse or partner, especially if you're relatively young, People usually eventually move on and they refashion their lives. Whereas I think for a lot of parents, they lose a child, there really is no moving on. Um, And so the inspiration for the book was really that. Um, But at the same time, I didn't know my cousin personally. Um, But my father, who was quite elderly and uh, who died shortly before his 93rd birthday, he had dementia at the end of his life. And it was pretty clear as I was writing this book that he was going to die before the, the book was complete. And so I think on some level... Uh, I channeled the impending grief that I was experiencing there, you know, into the book. Um, so I think, you know, it was, it was that. And then also there are other kinds of inspirations. I mean, there are literary inspirations. As I said before, I was very determined to write a book that was different from matrimony, that was much more in compressed time. And Rick Moody's novel, The Ice Storm, 
was very influential to me. That's a book that takes place over a very confined space and time. It takes place over a single holiday, in that case Thanksgiving. And at least is seemingly told in many points of view, similarly to the way that The World Without You is told. So they, those are various inspirations that sort of things that I borrowed from my life and from my reading that led to the book. And then there's the issue of using world events as well. You know, I've been reading a lot of reviews of the new Aaron Sorkin written uh, drama, The Newsroom, and they seem to single out his choice of setting it in the recent past, dealing with real news events in the recent past, as maybe the show's main failing. But here, you've managed to set in the recent past, use recent past events, and, and use them in a way that in a way that people are praising. So I wonder, did you see in that... A da- you know, in setting a book in 2005, a danger, it just in that in, that in itself? Um, you know, I think there's a danger in everything, and the, the danger of doing it badly. But I don't think it's any, it's any inherently more dangerous to use recent past events than to not use such events. I mean, you know, my agent about six, six to eight months ago said to me, you know, what are you going to say when people ask you about Daniel Pearl? And I said, oh, no, no, no one's going to ask me about Daniel Pearl. And of course she was right. I mean, every book... Uh, reading that I've given, it's, all, it's you know one of the very first questions. You know, Flannery O'Connor talks about how a writer needs a certain measure of stupidity okay. to be able to write fiction. And, you know, I'm a case in point. I mean, some of us come, come by naturally and others have to cultivate it. But I, in no conscious way, was thinking about Daniel Pearl when I was writing this book. At the same time, I'm not so stupid as to not recognize that probably because he was in the air, that infiltrated my consciousness. But I really wasn't interested in writing about those political events directly. I think what happened is that I wanted Leo to have, to die so, re- relatively suddenly. So I didn't want it to be a long, drawn-out disease. And I somehow thought that um, having him die in a car crash would be a little banal. And as I was starting to write these characters, it became more and more apparent to me that these were characters who were very engaged politically. Marilyn, the mother, and Lily, the, little, the middle sister, in particular, um, they're very political. They went down to Florida to protest the Bush v. Gore case. They... Uh, took leaves of absence from their work to campaign for Kerry. And so, and because Noel has become orthodox and has become quite politically conservative, it seemed like a chance for me to explore politics sort of indirectly. But for me, I'm always focused on character. To me, that's one of the paradoxes, is that if you want to write a book that feels universal, you have to be as particular as possible. You know, in other words, you have to really focus your gaze very narrowly. And if you try to write the big great American novel with all these big bursting themes, your book's going to fail, it's going to flop, it's going to be a lie. And if you want to write the big American novel, the way to do it is to focus with a laser-like gaze on your characters and not be concerned about themes and trust that because if your characters are smart and if they have ideas, those ideas will come in through the back door. So all the political stuff very much comes in through the back door for me, not through the front door. And what I'm most concerned with is writing characters who feel as real as or realer than the people in the reader's own lives. And one, one particular danger must be writing a book about, not, not necessarily about, that, that, is, that involves political issues, that the characters are involved with political issues. You certainly don't want any of these characters to be mistaken for an authorial mouthpiece, right? Absolutely. Um, you know, I talk about this also a lot with my graduate students who are extremely talented, but occasionally you do see a story from them where you feel like the author's allegiances are a little too clear that you feel like there's a particular character who is the mouthpiece for the author. And that's a, that's a big problem, because I think that a reader is going to feel manipulated. I think the reader wants to feel like his or her intelligence is being trusted. And I feel like that fiction is not the venue for political opinions, for messages of any sort. I think if you want to write a message, you should be a political scientist, a speechwriter, a rabbi, a priest, a sociologist. But that what a fiction writer does, at least the kind of fiction writer that I am, is he or she writes characters and tells a story. And so I think it's very important for the writer to, to love all of his or her characters equally. It doesn't mean that I want to spend time with them equally. I mean, I, there are certainly characters in this book whom I wouldn't want to spend 10 minutes with on a desert island. I mean, in fiction, like in life, some people are more pleasant, some people are more charming than others. But as a writer, you want to treat them all with dignity and treat them all with complexity. So if you ever feel like you're favoring one of them, you really need to overcompensate and head in the other direction. Because my job is not to make likable characters, but to make characters who are real and complicated. And I think the way to do that is to understand who they are and to not favor one or the other. 
Now, you mentioned Noel, the, the one of the siblings in this family who, who, who turns Orthodox, who moves to Jerusalem, who comes from Jerusalem to this memorial, and who a lot of reviewers, uh, they just love that scene where she and her family bring out their own kosher food because the kitchen isn't kosher, even though they've tried to make kosher food. That, that seems to stick in a lot of minds, even in my own, um, though I don't have much experience with Jewish culture. But it seems like in the Jewish press especially, they, they've been very fascinated by the divide between the family, the family's, uh, I've heard them called ultra-secular uh, Jewishness, and then Noel's, which she is as strict as she can handle being, it seems like. You know, I guess it makes sense they would be fascinated by that and find things to write about and examine in that. But did you foresee this novel becoming, uh, I, I guess, as rich a subject for specifically the Jewish-themed articles and, and reviews and, and things like that? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think that everyone sees things through their own lens. I mean, that's just what our experience is. So I'm not entirely surprised that when I, you know, when I've been interviewed by the Jewish press or when I've, I've given readings at, at synagogues and at JCC, that that's what they focus on. Whereas when I um, read at bookstores or, you know, talk to the non-Jewish press, that they focus on that. Last, you know, I was at a synagogue reading where someone who was Jewish asked me, did I think that that scene would resonate with people who haven't had that experience personally? And I, I said that I thought that it would. I mean, obviously, it means something different to someone who's had that personal experience. But I don't think it's hard for someone who's, you know, not religiously observant or not someone who's not Jewish at all to understand about the ways in which children and parents can manipulate each other. And of course, you know, I mean, I think food is such a primal thing. I think about this a lot. You know, I'm on book tour now and I'm away from my family, which has been quite hard. And I'm, one, I am have kids who are six and eight. Um, and there are a lot of things that have been quite surprising about being a parent, but to me, one of the most surprising things has been sort of how invested I have been in sort of my kids eating healthfully, you know, the food. And so while a couple of days ago I was talking to my wife, and my kids are fairly picky eaters, and my wife told me that my kids tried guacamole and they liked it. And I was just, I was happy beyond all reason. I thought, who, like, am I crazy? Like, why do I care that my kid eats guacamole? But I do think it, it, it points to the ways in which food is a very tense issue between, you know, parents and kids in terms of independence. I and mean, obviously a kid eventually grows up and he or she chooses uh, what he or she eats. Whereas when you're an infant, I mean, your parents are literally feeding you. You would starve to death without your parents feeding you. And then when you get to be a little older, they aren't literally feeding you, but they're often making decisions about, you know, how many treats you have a day. So I think that, you know, I think that there is something about that scene with the kosher food and the kosher dishes that really strikes a chord in everyone, not just you know, people who are who are Jewish. Although it's not surprising to me that in the Jewish press in particular, that's what they, they focus on a lot. What is the line between, you know, we talk about parents and parents getting their kids to eat certain things and making them, you know, the sort of parent-child food issues that can last a long time. What is the line between family family behaviors, universal family behaviors, using those in a way that makes them seem like cliches, which is what you want to avoid, or using them in a way that makes them seem like universals. And I mean, cliche, universal, right. cliche, un what's, yeah. what's really the difference? Yeah, right. But what is the difference? That's a great question. I mean, I think that, um, I mean, there's no easy answer other than to say that I think you have to do it. Well, I think it cuts to the, the question of originality. And this too comes up with my students. Is I see a lot of what I call anxiety about the anxiety of influence, <laughs> by which I mean, Meta-anxiety. Yeah, wow. meta-anxiety. I think there's a real um, there's a real fear out there that on my students' part, and I think on a lot of writers' part, that they're not being original. Someone once said there are only two kinds of stories. Stranger comes to town and a person goes on a trip, which is really one kind of story, since stranger comes to town and a person goes on a trip from a different point of view. And that makes some people anxious. It doesn't make me anxious, because I kind of feel like... I mean, if you summarize King Lear in a kind of glib way, you know, father trying to decide... You know, which of his daughters gets the inheritance? You'd say, cliche, cliche, cliche. But, you know, Shakespeare does it in such a way that it's not a cliche. And it was good enough for Shakespeare and it was good enough for Jane Smiley to set it on an Iowa farm many years later and win the Pulitzer for that. So I think it's all about the execution. And I actually see more problems in terms of the reaction to this, by which I mean, I see students of mine putting something sort of wacky and never been done before, but kind of outrageous into their stories and it doesn't work and you hope it's never done again. Um, and so I think that um, I mean, the line between what's original and cliched, I mean, it has to do with how original the insights are, how good the language is. I mean, I think every story has been told, but 
if the characters are unique and really jump off the page. And I think you know, this comes up again when I teach because I only teach graduate students now, so I'm very fortunate to have some incredible writers. But back when I was teaching undergraduates, I would not infrequently come up against the phenomenon of what I thought was a really cliched story, and all the students loved it. And I would say to them, you know, why do you love it? And they said, well, it re- it's so true. It reminds me of so many people I know. And as soon as I st- they said that, that proved to me why the story wasn't working, because it reminded them of so many people they know. Whereas I think that a good piece of fiction reminds you of no one you know, and yet it also feels like it, a- it rings true to you. I think it's the shock of the unfamiliar as opposed to the unshock of the unfamiliar, if that were a word. That I think, you know, if you read Lolita, I think one of the reasons that the Lolita is banned or has been banned in places is because we like Humbert Humbert and we don't like the fact that we identify with Humbert Humbert. So I think the way that you make something not cliched is use language in a sufficiently original way. I mean, Cheever talked about never using three words in a row that he'd seen used in a row before. So you're first referred to a bruise as blue and black as opposed to black and blue. I think if you're sufficiently original with language, with psychological insight, then it doesn't matter if the story has been told before. But, you know, obviously if it were easy to do, you know, I'd be a millionaire and I'd be able, I'd have a lot of students banging on my door. And I think, you know, it takes, you have to read a lot, you have to revise a lot, it takes a long time. It seems like with readers, tell me if you've seen this, but they'll read The World Without You and they'll have that sense at first with some of the characters. Oh, Daniel Pearl, oh, Cindy Sheehan. But then you, you'll, you, you bring in a number of details that then make them forget about those those people, uh, at least in terms of them being versions of, of those sure. people. Now, I, from what you've said, I mean, you weren't, you weren't thinking Daniel Pearl yourself, you weren't thinking Cindy Sheehan yourself, but it does seem like, in some sense, you've, you've, you managed to push that out of their minds. I don't know how conscious or unconscious you see that as being. Right. I think for the first draft, very, very little is conscious. I mean, I think that's where this, this stupidity that Flannery O'Connor talks about comes into play. I think, you know, for the first couple of years, you are just writing, it's not, you don't, not whether it's going to be a good novel or a bad novel, you just don't even know, even know if it's going to be a novel at all. And then you get all those pages together, and then you try to find the book inside those pages. So I think for the initial forays into the book, it's very intuitive and subconscious. But I think that, you know, obviously I live in the world, and I talk to people, and I have friends, and I read, and so... You know, Daniel Pearl is in the air, Cindy Sheehan is in the air. So you take these tropes, but then you make them your own. And so the more you write and the more you get to know your characters, the more different they become from those original figures that might have inspired them. I think things start to get more conscious in revision when you have certain problems that you need to fix and you need to figure out ways that work in terms of narrative and that also are compelling on the level of character. But when you're starting out, I think it's very, very dangerous to have a plan. I mean, it's intentional, but it's subconscious. And that, you know, I really, really stay away from planning things out in advance. Now, with these characters who have strong political stances in the world without you, do any of them, did any of them, when they became more and more real, more and more detailed, could any of them convince you of things, of their points, of elements of their points of view that you might have disagreed more strongly with to begin with? I mean, did you find yourself getting a little, getting a little t- more toward characters that you had? made to be different from you or how did, did that work in any in any sense at all i mean i think your character cer- characters certainly do influence you um I, mean, I wouldn't say i i changed my political opinions as a result of writing the book certainly and um i do have strong political opinions strong opinions about the war but but no one should be able to know those opinions from reading the book it's very important to me to that i stay outside the book i guess the only thing i'd say in terms of what you're asking is that part of um of writing fiction that works is really being imagine, being able to inhabit someone, imagine someone who's quite different from you. And so you have to take seriously the opinions of someone who's quite different from you. So while I wouldn't say that anyone changed my mind, I think it, the process of writing fiction leaves you, has to leave you open to the experience of someone quite different from yourself. And that's illuminating on its own. I want to know a little bit more about, about the way that teaching can the way that teaching affects the writing that you do in books like The World Without You. I mean, it seems like some writers keep it so separate, or they claim to, they claim to compartmentalize. It seems like you use the teaching as, as, a, as a feedback loop, and not, not directly, but in some sense a feedback loop with the way you think about fiction. Is that too much to say, or is that true? No, I think I, I, that's not too much to say at all. I think it's totally 
True. I mean, you know, and, and in matrimony, there are because Julian is a writer, there are sections that take place in writing workshops. So I didn't literally borrow stuff from class, but I mean, having taught classes and been in classes, writing classes, that certainly helped. Yeah, I mean, I think there are writers who are more naturally intuitive writers than I am and who wouldn't begin to know how to teach because they're doing things right, but they aren't even aware that they're doing it right. It just, it, it's a very subconscious thing. For me, it was sort of the opposite. I had to teach myself to become a more intuitive writer. Like, I always, I always wanted to be a fiction writer, but I also always wanted to be a basketball player. And at some point, you realize you're neither good enough nor tall enough. And so that's how I kind of felt about fiction writing, that I wasn't good enough or tall enough. And um, I went to Harvard for college, and I was studying political theory, and I come from this sort of perverse family in the sense that um, my father was an academic. He was he taught at Columbia Law School for 50 years, and he led a quite successful, charmed, uh, professional life. And so I think I was probably the one person in the country who thought that uh, the safe, conservative route would be to get a PhD in the humanities. So that's what I was going to do, is that I was going to get a PhD in political theory. But before I did that, I decided to take off a year after I finished college. And I was born in 1964, and I grew up near Columbia. And one of my first memories is of 1968, my mother taking me up to the Greenhouse Nursery School past Columbia campus, um, and we got stopped at College Walk. Uh, we were stopped by the protesters, by the police, and we were sent home, and that was my version of a snow day. And I think I always had this romanticized idea about the 60s that I was somehow born too late and I missed out on them. And I thought if Columbia was great, Berkeley was even better. And so when I graduated from college, I was determined to move out to Berkeley for what I thought would be um, a year off. And so I moved out to Berkeley and I lived for a couple of weeks on the floor of an apartment of a friend of mine. But eventually I had to find my own place and in order to pay the rent, I had to get a job. And so I got a job working at a magazine and one of the things I was doing at the magazine was that I was the first reader of fiction manuscripts. And I saw how many terrible manuscripts there were and I didn't necessarily think I could do any better, but I thought if other people were willing to try and risk failure, then I should be willing to try and risk failure too. And so I started to take some workshops, and I got some encouragement, and you know, the rest, as I say, is history. But this is all by way of saying that, for me, I was someone who, very early on, was able to figure out what was and wasn't working in other people's stories. But it took me a much longer time to be able to make it work in my own stories. And so for me, it's a very integral part of the process of sort of sort of thinking around in a very analytical way how to make something work and how to make something not work and to imitate what works and avoid what doesn't work. And that process was very instrumental to my becoming a writer and it remains instrumental to these days so that when I teach my graduate students, although it's true that I've been at this longer than they have and that I am more experienced than they are, on some level we're really all struggling with the same things. And time and again, I'll see my students having certain problems in their stories, and I'll see that those are problems that I'm experiencing in my own stories. And so what I'm doing really by writing is that I'm practicing what I preach. So for someone like me, I feel like teaching in a day-in and a day-out way really helps the, the writing process. What are some of those patterns you remember emerging in the non-working stories, those manuscripts you read early on? I mean, what, what clearly popped out at you eventually as being like, yeah, I can, I can certainly see a pitfall there? Yeah, I mean, there's so many of them, but um, I think a, a lot of stories in which narrative is not growing out of character, where it feels like they're parallel, where you have these characters and the events feel like the events have been foisted on the story by the writer and they're not coming out of the character. Whereas, as I was saying before, I think story grows out of character. I think it's you know a complex symbiotic process. We both create our stories and are created by them. So you'll often see stories where you know, a character is doing nothing and just sort of sitting around watching and then it gets to page 17 and you see you see something that's clicked with the writer the writer thinks, okay, time to make something happen. So something like absurd and outrageous. You know, someone all of a sudden wins the lottery. You know, and something, something big happens. I think that big events work better at the beginning of story, coincidences. I, mean, I think if you want to have a story about winning the lottery, fine for that to happen at the beginning of the story. That's the baseline assumption. And then the story becomes about how people react to winning the lottery as opposed to having it come at the end of the story to kind of rescue the story, <laughs> become the deus ex machina, and then you sort of feel like the writer has inserted his or her hand to make things happen. So I see a lot of people struggling with the relationship between plot and character, and it's a hard relationship, it's hard to do right. Do, do you think they're afraid of putting the big event first? You know, if they were writing The World Without You, maybe they would be afraid to have uh, the sun killed in Iraq before the book begins. They would say, well, no, I need, I need 100 pages and then it happens. Like, you don't... You feel like you want to ease into it somehow, like you need to 
take it really slow to make sure the reader doesn't just get shocked by a big thing happening right away? I, th- I think that's true. I think a lot, of, a lot of people do think that way, but I think they tend to be wrong. Oh, yeah. By which I mean that to me it's easier to have the big event toward the beginning and then have the book be about the aftershocks than... I mean, you know, there are good books that lead to big events, and I've written stories that lead to big events, so it's certainly a way to write. But I think that, um, that a lot of times those big events are harder to do later in the book because they don't always grow organically out of what, what's come before, and the author has some big event in his or her mind. Whereas if you get that big event out there early, that becomes the engine that drives the book. I mean, in the world without you, there are really two big events, the death a year ago, and more centrally right now, the new thing is the parent separation. And in an earlier draft of the book, the parents weren't separating. And it felt to me like the book was stagnating. And as soon as I figured out that the parents were separating, to make that, it's much easier to make a big change at the base of the tree and then have the branches grow out from there as opposed to making the change on the fly with the branches where your base feels like it's not supporting those branches. So I often think that if you change the fundamental assumptions of your book early on, that's the easier way to go than to try to do it on the fly later in a kind of more piecemeal, haphazard way. Now, as I mentioned before, you direct the MFA program in fiction writing at Brooklyn College. And listeners, even if they haven't been to Brooklyn, will probably know Brooklyn as, if anything, a place where a lot of people go to write or a lot of people want to write once they go there. What is it about Brooklyn as a writing environment? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how this quite happened. I mean, I grew up in Manhattan, and then I lived all over the country for a variety of years. And then when I came back to, to New York... Brooklyn was a very different place from what it, when I was a kid Brooklyn was a place where your grandmother lived and now it's a place where you know every hipster wants to live you know uh, you know, Colson White had had this uh, end paper piece in the New York Times book review a couple of years ago that was basically sort of get over it this is just where I live and I kind of feel a little bit that way too like I don't think there's anything in particular about Brooklyn that inspires me I mean I love living in Brooklyn I you know it's urban but it's smaller scale so it has a sense of community it's certainly not cheap, but it's less less expensive than Manhattan. So there are reasons why artists live there, but probably artists will end up moving to Queens in a few years as Brooklyn gets too expensive. So I'm, I'm certainly part of the Brooklyn cliche. I'm a writer with a wife and two dogs, sorry, a wife and two kids and a dog, and there's some male or female version of me just about on every block in Park Slope where I live. So yeah, I'm not sure, quite sure how it happened, and I, I, I like living there, but I kind of feel like you write wherever you live, and if Brooklyn dropped off the map and my family had to move somewhere else, I'd write there too. I'm not a big believer in a place being inspiration. I think a writer writes wherever he or she is, and if you don't do that, then you're not really writing. You don't need to live near other writers then to write. It's, it doesn't make a difference, really. To me, definitely not. In fact, I mean, I would say the vast, although I know a lot of writers, and obviously I teach writers and I have colleagues who are writers, I would say that most of my close friends are not writers. I'm not looking to hang out with other writers. I mean, if I happen to like another writer, that's great. But um, I have my family and friends. And um, I mean, writing is very solitary. And it's like you do it on your own. And um, yeah, it's not important for me to be... I mean, it's important for me to be able to talk about writing and, and teaching serves that purpose. But beyond that, I don't need to surround myself with writers. There must be something to be said, a lot to be said for living a life filled with non-writers as a writer because you don't want to end up having only writers to populate your novels, right? Absolutely. And I think it's true for, I mean, do doctors want to hang out only with doctors and do lawyers want to hang out with only, only with lawyers and do engineers want to hang out only with engineers? I mean, maybe they do, but I, I think, I mean, I think it, the cliche is true that variety is the spice of life. And, you know, why not hang out with a scientist who's thinking about things that are totally different from what I'm thinking about? I'm likely to, to get a much different perspective from them than I would from, you know, hanging out with another writer. <laughs> Now, you mentioned growing up in New York City and, and living there now and living all over the place in the in sort of an uh, interim between. Tell me about your relationship with New York City. I mean, is it a place you, you knew you would, even while living elsewhere, wanted, you knew you would return to? You knew you wanted to return to? You know, it's weird. I mean, I did grow up there and I have returned to it. So I, that's presumably not a coincidence. And um, my parent, my mom lives there and my parents, my dad lived, my, my mom and dad lived there until my dad died, my mom continues to live there. I have one brother who lives in New York, I have one brother who lives in San Francisco. Um, so I am an urban person at heart, and so I think it's not a coincidence that I ended up back there, but I don't think it was inevitable. I lived in the Bay Area after college, and I, for a while I saw myself moving back to the Bay Area. I lived in Boston for a number of years, I lived in Ann Arbor for eight years. I've lived in a lot of college towns. 
and uh, and I like college towns. My wife, who is an academic, happens not to like college towns. She doesn't like to be living in a place where everyone does what she does. Yes. So on some level, she's been more of the force behind staying in New York. I think it's harder for her to imagine leaving New York than it is for me. But now, you know, we've been in Brooklyn now for 12, 13 years. We own our house. Our kids are happy in school. We both have jobs that we like. So it becomes harder to imagine uh, living elsewhere. But if I were forced to, I would be able to do it. I mean, I, you know, I hate suburbia. I mean, I think I really I, could, I couldn't live in the suburbs. But I, as long as I was living in, in an urban area or possibly in a certain kind of liberal college town uh, where there are enough like-minded people, I could make a life for myself. But, I, you know, I, at this point I've lived, you know, more than half my life in New York, and I feel like New York is very much a part of me. And it, I think it's not a coincidence that, you know, matrimony starts in New York and ends in New York. Uh, the world value, although it takes place in the Berkshires, someone refers to the Berkshires as, you know, the Massachusetts outpost of the Upper West Side. So I think there's a way that even when my characters are not in New York, they're either deeply from New York or escaping from New York. They're always in relationship to New York in some oh, sort of way. Writers who grew up in New York often credit the place and credit their childhood there as having given them not necessarily material, but sort of made their minds good places to uh, to begin thinking about writing fiction. Is is that a way you frame it, or is it just was it just for you a, a, an interesting place to grow up? Well, I think it was both an interesting place to grow up, but because it was that, um, it helped my fiction. I mean, Flannery O'Connor said anyone who's survived childhood has enough material to write about for a lifetime. And I think she, what she means is any childhood. My childhood happened to be in New York, so my own memories are very, you know, inflected with and infused by New York. But if I'd grown up in the Bahamas or in Nicaragua or in Connecticut, then that would have been the particular childhood. And I think that, you know, then my, 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 my material would have been infused by that. So I don't think there's anything particular to New York that makes it, you know, better for fiction than anything else. I think that that was just my childhood. That said, I think, you know, there's a lot of stuff happening in New York, and I'm thankful that I grew up in a place that was, you know, filled with ferment, and if I was living in a small suburb somewhere, I might have grown restless. But there are other people for whom, you know, they want to flee the city and go to the suburbs, and everyone's different. I'm very much of a city kid at heart. Now, with this show as opposed to the old one, that one of the qualities I, I like about it is being able to get a sense of place by being in actual places, speaking face-to-face. Your novels also are often called novels with a sense of place. I, I think I've thought of them that way as well, but, I mean, does that phrase mean anything to you when writing sense of place? Yeah, well, I think place is very important in fiction. I mean, there are certain books where you think of, like, the place being an actual character. Um, and I think Flannery O'Connor is a good example. A lot of Faulkner's work where you have that sense that, pl- that the place is a person in the book um, so uh, place is essential I think in all fiction I think that place comes less naturally to me than people do by which I mean that it's very easy for me to write about characters I've never met or have them say lines of dialogue I've never heard said or have them do things I've never seen done it's harder for me um, to write about a place where I've never been which is why I tend to set my to set my books either in places where I've spent a lot of time, or in fictional places where I can just imagine what the place is like. I'm envious of those writers who can I don't know set a book in Portugal without ever having been to Portugal. Like if my novel, my next novel, were to be set in Portugal, I'd need to spend a considerable amount of time in Portugal. And it's interesting because at some point in the writing process, my editor sort of kindly but gently said to me. So how much time have you spent in the Berkshires anyway? And I said, well, actually, a few weekends. And she said, yeah, that's what I thought. And so she said, you need to go back to the Berkshires. So I took a few trips to the Berkshires, you know, walked around like a dork with my uh, with my uh, tape recorder, and I got a real sense of the Berkshires, and I think the book is much richer for that, because I think now when you read the book, it feels like it was written by someone who has spent some time in the Berkshires. So I'm, I'm not big on research in general. I only half joke when I say that I started to write fiction so as not to do research but I think that in terms of place I need to have a real sense of the texture of the place the names the streets the stores what the people are look like what you know what they're wearing and so to that extent I do do some research because I think place is very important in fiction and furthermore a lot of readers a lot of non-east coast readers I mean you could describe the Berkshires any way you wanted they wouldn't know you could put one over on them I suppose but you you, you certainly have not put one over on them you've gone there and, and researched but what, I mean, what kind of a place is it, just for those who have never been there? Yeah, well, I think, I mean, to some extent, Great Barrington and Lennox 
are the uh, you know Massachusetts outposts of the Upper West Side of Manhattan. I think you know a lot of you know upper middle class city people you know vacation there over the summer. I mean you know there is there are the there are the locals, and I think there is some town you know towny uh, summer people kind of tension. But um, I, I see it as a kind of like rarefied kind of privileged place, and I think that that's one reason I set the book there. I'm interested in contrast. You know, whatever you think about politically about what happened in Iraq, I mean, a lot of people were killed, a lot of terrible things happened. There's a lot of horror there. And I think of the Berkshires as a kind of place, a bucolic place, a kind of place that was created so as to erase all trace of horror. And so what is it like to be in the Berkshires grieving for someone who died at a great geographic and temporal remove? What is it like to be grieving over July 4th when everyone else else is celebrating. So I think of the Berkshires as kind of this place where you're inoculated from the real world. And then what is it like to have the real world intrude on you in a very concrete and horrifying way? So I see, in a weird way, I see the Berkshires as a place that's you know, very much apart from real life. And I think people go there as a way of having a different life from what their life is like. And that's what drew me to the Berkshires. Douglas Copeland said this about the suburbs, but is it one of those places where you, you make part of the deal as you, you, you deny that death exists? I think so. I think I think that, I mean, the Berkshires is not suburbia, but I do think it has that feeling of wanting to sort of push away death. So what what happens when you go to a place where you push away death and then death intrudes on you and can't be pushed away? I mean, to me, that's a very interesting fictional possibility. And this, this I would call it a sense of anti-place or an anti-sense of place. Uh, for faraway places, places one hasn't been, I mean, that's essentially all of America and the Middle East or Iraq, right? I mean, the, the, I don't know if you consider it the dominant, the dominant theme of how America has thought about the war, but it's the difficulty of conceiving of Iraq, if, if you know what I mean. Has, has that given you, did it give you much to think about in writing about these sort of American perspectives on the war in this book? Absolutely. I mean, I think that that's, what, that's the interesting tension here is that, I mean, I have very strong feelings about Iraq and about politics in the Middle East, and a lot of people I know do, and yet... It's been very far removed, I and mean, we don't know what it I mean. We, I mean, I guess if you've been there, you, but I've never been there. You know, some people have asked me why I chose to, you know, have Leo be a journalist killed in Iraq as opposed to a soldier, and I guess it's a somewhat perplexing question to me because Leo comes from a demographic that doesn't produce soldiers. It comes from a demographic that produces journalists. And I think that, you know, for people like Marilyn and David and for Leo's sisters, I mean, they all have very strong feelings strong political feelings, but it, it is the, the big other, the great other out there, and it's very abstract. And I think that that's, you know, that's what makes it so horrifying, is that we're not living it, and we, you know, we see it on TV, but it's, it's you know, we, we go about our lives, and we, we sit in coffee shops and do interviews about books and things like that, and I think there's a, there becomes this kind of dichotomous existence where you know about these horrible things going on, and yet you continue to, to live your life and drink your coffee, and that's, that's a hard thing. And of course, in the book, I mean, you have Noel, the, the sister who lives in the Middle East, and I, I don't. Do, do you see that as giving her any sort of? I don't want to say advantage, but she seems to use it that way. Do you know what I mean? Uh, yeah. Where it's like, the, I guess every character in the book uses what they have in terms of to get advantage over the other ones. But her actually coming from the region seems to. I mean, what does that give her as a character? when it comes down to these issues of Iraq and death there. Right. Well, she certainly sees herself as being in the position of righteousness. It certainly gives her a, a degree of self-righteousness. I mean, I've I have spent some time in Israel, and I have, a, I have a sense of Jerusalem, a pretty clear sense of Jerusalem, and I know a lot of people like that, particularly Americans who have moved to Israel and have the attitude of like, oh, you limousine liberals back in the Berkshires living your cloistered life. But we know what it's like to have our boys go to war, and we see it every day. And, uh, you know, I guess I'm torn about that. I mean, they see certain things every day, but they also don't see other things every day. And living in Jerusalem is very different from living in Baghdad. And, I mean, everyone has their limited perspective. We're all, I mean, we're all limited in that, in that sort of way. But I do know a lot of Israelis, a lot of American Israelis, who do have Noel's attitude of, easy for you to be, you know, a liberal there. I know that Bush is Israel's greatest friend, and, you know, that's not so clear. And I think there are two sides to every story. But certainly, by being proximate to what happened and by being in the Middle East, she feels that she has the upper hand. And so does Amram, her husband. 
Now, having done so many interviews and, and there have been so much, so much press and more to come for, for the world without you, have, has any of this coverage, be it interviews or reviews, has it, has it brought any new perspectives on, onto these characters that you hadn't considered before? I mean, is that something that happens with all these interviews, with all these, with all these reviews, or is that something that, I mean, authors just understand that, no, I've pretty much thought of everything with these characters, and it's interesting maybe to talk about the books, but is, is it ever, is, are there ever surprises, I suppose? There are surprises. It's very hard for me to point to a particular one and say, oh, I hadn't thought about X, and then this happened. Right. But um, I mean, it certainly is true that I, mean, I live with these characters day in and day out for five years, so um, so I know a lot about them. But I do think that I mean, it's an interesting process seeing as many reviews as I have and and doing as many interviews. Is that you know, is a weird lag time? Like you work for five years in the book, and then the book was essentially finished close to a year ago, and you're busy with you know copy editing and production and things that are related to the book, but you're no longer really engaged with the characters. And you're moving on to new things and then you like talk to a book group say or you talk to an interviewer and usually that person has just read the book and so they know the book on some level uh, if not better they, they know it more recently than you know it so they certainly keep you on your toes and I also think that the process of being a writer and being a, an interviewer being a critic is very different I mean and I always give the example that a friend of mine in college wrote her psychology thesis on how adults group objects versus how kids group objects and the adults group the apple with the banana, and kids group the monkey with the banana. And that's a way of saying that kids are more natural storytellers than adults are. And adults think in terms of theme and category. And I think that a writer has to teach him or herself to think like a child again, albeit like a smart, sophisticated child. And so part of the issue is not like learning things per se, it's really about talking a different kind of language. Like I will see what a reviewer says about the book and they'll say, oh, the book is about grief, and the book is about the Iraq War. The book is about, you know, you know, family, and all those things have a certain kind of truth. But to me, the book is just about these characters. It's about the particular. So I guess what I learn from interviews or from reviews is that I I'm reminded of the different perspective that a critic has on the book, and it's not a better or worse perspective. It's a different perspective, and so I, I think it's enlightening to to go at the book from a different angle. And I, that's that's what really that's where you really learn the most I'd say it, it seems never quite welcome to to hear to be told what your book is about or to be asked what your book is about is it I mean that word about it's not it's just kind of like uh, that's maybe not the that's maybe not how I had thought of this book you know aboutness right. well I do think that's the way that writers and, and critics can be at cross purposes I think it's a totally legitimate question for an interviewer certainly to ask and you, if you're on the radio and, and the people who are listening haven't necessarily read your book. I think it's important for the writer to be able to, to try to give a sense to the reader of what a book is about. And if you look at sort of the, the flap copy of a book, that's what it does. And this is what the book is about. I do think that writers sort of, some bristle or sort of resist it because, I mean, I think it was Jonathan Franzen who said that the easier it is to summarize your book, the worse book it is. And I think that's true. You know, Martin Amos in his novel, The Information, which is essentially a spoof of writers and of book tours, he's got a, a big writer... Uh, on a big book tour and the writer shows up on a radio show and he's being interviewed by someone you know, very different from this radio show where it's clear that the interviewer has not read the book and so the writer keeps saying you know, what's, what's the book about and the writer refuses to answer and the guy keeps saying well, what's the book about and finally the writer says the book, it, it, the book isn't about anything it just is I wrote it in 200,000 words and if I could have written it in fewer I would and I think that there's you know, even though the writer is being a jerk on some level and being stubborn, I think there's a kind of truth to what he's saying, which is that I, I think there's something about fiction that is very committed to the idea of its being irreducible. That, it, you know, if you could have there be cliff notes, and, I mean, there's a reason that cliff notes are not a good substitute for the book, and it's not just because your kid in high school or junior high school might get caught by the teacher. I think there's a belief, and it's a belief that I hold, that if the book can simply be if, if the summary, the plot summary of the, of the book is as good as the book itself, then the book is not very good. And that there's something, as I said before, irreducible about the book, and that it's about the experience of reading every single one of those words and the feeling you get. And so I think writers are torn between understanding that they need to say, well, the book is about a journalist killed in Iraq who's left parents who are separating and three siblings and a wife and a son, all of which are true, and understanding that he has to say that the way I'm saying it in this case 
and also feeling like, like no, that the book is about much more than that. And I think there's a tension there. So I both understand why that question needs to be asked, and I understand why the answer needs to be answered, but I also resist it on some level. And when does a book like The World Without You release its psychological hold on you enough so that you can start really putting a lot of words down on the next thing? Yeah, that's also a complicated thing. I mean, I think that, you know, Joyce Carol Oates once said that she has to believe that everything, she, whatever she's writing at the moment is the best thing she's ever written, which for Joyce Carol Oates to feel is, you know, quite, quite a thing because, you know, she writes more than most people read. Um, but I think it does illustrate the way in which you are totally immersed in your book when you're writing it. And then when you're done writing it, the characters are dead for you and you're moving on to the next thing. And then what happens is that a year after you're done writing it, you go on book tour and you do interviews and all of a sudden those characters come alive again. So I think it's a weird kind of thing where when I finished the book, it felt it was over and I'd moved on, but now they're sort of being resurrected for me, you know, by talking to you and, and to other people. But, you know, a writer writes and, you know, you need to go on book tour, you need to do the things you need to do to help uh, have the book do well. But what you're really looking to do is to go back to the process of writing. So, I mean, I've been working on some short stories. Uh, I was doing it this past, uh, this past fall. The last few months have been very taken up with publicity for this book. But when the book tour is over, I want to get back to those stories. I'm starting to have some vague sense of an idea for a new novel, but it hasn't quite come to me yet. So, But hopefully, come the fall, I'll be you know, well on the way of my next project. I've been speaking here in West Hollywood, sitting out here on Fairfax, with Joshua Hink, an author of The World Without You, his third novel, director of the MFA program in fiction writing at Brooklyn College, a genuine Brooklyn writer here in Los Angeles. Uh, so it's a taste of things to come, listeners, for when I record shows in Brooklyn one day. Hopefully sometime soon. Joshua, thanks again for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks so much, Collins. It's really been great to be here, and I look forward to welcoming you when you come to Brooklyn. This has been Notebook on Cities and Culture. I've been Colin Marshall. Keep up with all the cultural creators, internationalists, and observers of the urban scene on the show at colinmarshall.org. Thanks. And special thanks to the people backing this season, including Aidan Nolman, Andy Cooney, Ben Bartley, Brian J. Dell, Doubt Us Artwork, Greg Bigelow, Greg Linster, Henry Coronan, Humberto Grant, James Faber, Jonathan McKelmont, Mark Larson, Matt Warren, Mia Muratori, Nicholas Croft, Paul Doyle, Ray McGuire, Rob Montz, Robert Foley, Roberto Medri, Samuel Hansen, Sean Dudley, Small Demons, Stephen Inglaze, Steve Hemmer, TSD, and Wayne Wright.